and love your neighbor as yourself. And the first thing that will happen to every singular human being on planet Earth is that we will be offended and will offend other people. Did we get that? Can you say yes? Thank you. You can't avoid it. Even children offend each other unknowingly, but adults do that more. So the purpose of this message is to teach clearly what happens if I choose not to forgive. So forgiveness is a choice, yes. And again, it's not on the person who has offended you. It is on me. The Bible is very clear. I'll get ahead of my notes a little bit. The Bible says, as much as it depends not on the offender, but on me who has been offended, I should be at peace with how many people? Everybody. These things are not difficult. What interrupts is what our pastor said last week about pride. Pride is one of the main things we don't forgive. We say to ourselves, why will I belittle my, to go and humble myself and say, I'm sorry. But once you get over that hub, oh, it's wonderful. Amen. It's wonderful. Amen. Brethren, you would see how you escape your own prison today. How you get out of prison. The prison that you created by saying, I will not, I choose not to forgive. So we we'll know it today. And from today we'll all live free. Amen. I'm going to preach a message on um, radical freedom. God has given us freedom. But we imprison ourselves. And I thank my wife for coming to share that testimony as a prelude to this message. You heard somebody killing your brothers. Not one, not two, not three, not four. Yet, because we are human and because we are prone, we are wired to revenge. That's all of us. When somebody does something to you, you want to do it back. You feel like you have to vindicate yourself. That's our nature. But once we have the nature of God, things change. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And things will change for you and for me from today. I will not belabor this, the reading of Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Um, um, which uh, Minister Grace went over. But just a few highlights. I will encourage you to come on Wednesday because this passage in Matthew 18, 21 to 35 is so pregnant with truths. Jesus gives, tells a story. But before Jesus tells this story, for people to know, he later on went and did everything for us. As recorded in uh, Colossians 2 from verse 13 to 15. When he went to the cross and took upon ourselves, upon himself, our sin debt. He took all of it. He forgave you so that you can now forgive others. Today you will hear that forgiveness is not a concept. Forgiveness is a virtue. Forgiveness is a gift from God that he has given you to give to others. So you are a conduit of God's forgiveness. If we didn't know these things, we will know them today. And we will live from here free. I'm free. Free at last. Because many people think that we only deserve political freedom. No. Like Nigeria where uh, I was told this morning by one of the uh, members of this church who is sick um, that they have a lady who is helping them because they are recuperating and that Nigeria is on fire because most of the Muslims want to become president but this guy is a minister, he knows Jesus, he loves Jesus and wants to become president. So there is a mighty conflict going now in Nigeria. And our sister gave us a prayer topic on... Friday, 
to pray about Nigeria. The same thing happens here. So, people may think that because they live in America, they are free. But there's a greater freedom that many people don't have. The inner freedom. Amen. When you have fear hidden in you, when you have anxiety, when you have uh, things that make you shake from within, you are not truly free. You may live in a land that is free, but you are entirely not free. It is better to be free inside and live in a place that your, your, your physical bar frontiers are, have barriers than to live in a place where you can do anything, say anything, you invite men to become women and teach children in the nursery and uh, uh, sing terrible songs to them and do terrible gestures. Oh, I'm in a free land. That's not freedom. True freedom comes from within. And Jesus came to set you free. We'll look at that message someday. But again, as I said, please come on Wednesday so we can dissect the passage, Matthew 18, 21 to 35. We meet here in the sanctuary. This message, many people have many questions about forgiveness. It is the opportune time to ask those questions. And we will not give you the answers from our heads. We will give you the answers from the word of God. This is the truth. We believe in nothing else. Not in human philosophy or ideologies. This book gives you answers to your questions. Especially regarding the subject of forgiveness. Will you say amen? amen. Father, we thank you as we bring this message that you will give us understanding, you will give us clarity, and you will give us the motivation to be set free in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read the text verse very quickly. I chose a verse in the Old Testament by somebody who knew what it means to go through torment. David went through a lot in his life. Before he became king, while he was king, you know, his son Absalom wanted to kill him and take over the throne. And so, when you look at the character in the Bible, you look at the character of David, the author of Psalm 103, verse 2 and 3. Again, as the culture, if you would please read with me, because the word of God is so sweet. Amen? Amen. Can we read Psalm 103, verse 2 and 3 together? Go. Bless the Lord. Oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What are his benefits? Who forgives all your iniquities? And those what? Who heals all your diseases? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! My God! That's why we had as text, as our title, Love that forgives and love that heals. Are we together? Oh, yes. My daughter likes that expression so much. She'll pay for it. Hallelujah. Now, let us have as introduction. Let's, let's talk. Let's talk. When did God demonstrate his love to me? We have, to, we have a place to start. Everything in life has a beginning. Doesn't it? The Bible says in the beginning, God created. So everything in your life has a beginning. You came to this earth not when you were born. When you were your mother's womb, you had come. But only saw you. Hallelujah. When you came out. But you had been conceived right in there. Now listen to this. I'd like us now to see the clear answer from Romans 5, 6 and verse 8. Are you with me? Are you with me? Good. Let us read it together. Go. When we were utterly helpless. Let's end there. Utterly helpless means you could do nothing to reach God. You could do nothing to connect with God. You could no, do nothing. Absolutely. We were helpless. And the Bible says utterly helpless. Hopelessly helpless. To connect back with God. Because of the sin that we inherited from Adam and Eve. That's in nature. Let's continue reading. Christ came at just the right time. And died for us 
sinners. Who was a sinner here? Living in sin. Amen. I was. I was a sinner living in sin. But during that time that you were still living in sin, Christ died for you. He died for me. He died for the whole world. Amen. When we were utterly helpless, to back that up, as you know, Bible teaching church, we need another verse to back that up. Can we read verse 8 of the same chapter? Go. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Will you say amen to that? Now let's get to the heart of the message. Why forgiveness? Why do we have forgiveness? We have forgiveness because God first loved us. And so there's the equation which you'll see on Wednesday, I'll write on the board. There are two words called salvation and redemption. Salvation and redemption are both gifts from the Lord. And salvation and redemption have two major characteristics. The first one is forgiveness. Amen. God first forgave you. And the second gift, he gave you eternal life. The moment you come to the Lord and say, I am the sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I cannot make it to heaven on my own. God says, your forgiveness is already guaranteed. Amen? And once you receive that forgiveness as a gift from God, you are now able to live for God. But secondly, the forgiveness is just not a temporal forgiveness like we'll see soon when somebody says, I forgive you. And you do something again. Ah, oh, okay. You did this last time. Amen? That's human nature. But when God give, forgives, he gives you eternal life. Every genuine forgiveness is accompanied with eternal life. God doesn't do things in half measures. When God does things, he does them in full measures. Will you say amen with me? Amen. So that's the equation we'll see. When you talk about redemption or you talk about salvation, it has two major components. The first one is that the first thing God does to you is he forgives you. And at the same time, when you are truly and genuinely forgiven, you are, you are given eternal life to be with him forever. Praise the Lord. Now, back to us. What, how do we respond with the gift? With the what? The gift that we've been given. Forgiveness is a gift that you've been given. Paul writes in Romans, I mean Colossians 3.13. Why forgiveness is necessary for others. Because we've been forgiven much, we can now also forgive those who, for, who offend us. Do you see the logic? Can we read together Colossians 3.13? And look at the commands there. Because we'll look at three or four things that we get from that little passage. And we'll discuss it in detail on Wednesday. Read with me Colossians 3.13. Go. You must make allowance for each other's faults. And forgive the person who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. The word must is a command. If you love God, if I love God, I will obey him. The Bible says you show you love God by obeying him. That's the only way. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I didn't make the, he didn't give us the ten commandments in the New Testament. He gave us two. He summed up the ten in the old and made them into two. And these are the words of our Lord from the scriptures. Must make allowance. Must forgive. Because we have been forgiven. God never asked us to do anything without him giving us the ability and the resources to do them. Never. When people see Christianity and say, oh, Christian life is, is hard to do, it's hard to walk, it's hard to keep, it is because we do not understand what we have been given. We've been equipped. If I asked you to go and mow a lawn, I didn't give you a lawn mower. Will you mow the lawn with your teeth? You know, you, if you give me uh, meat to chop into pieces, am I going to cut the meat 
with my hands. I have to give you a knife. In everything in this life that you're going to go through, God has given you the wonderful, tangible, magnificent equipment to get the job done in Jesus' name. So let's look at um, a couple of things. I listed three uh, that come from the passage. By nature, all of us want to get even. Can I get a hand show? That's the way we are made. Somebody hits you, you want to hit back. Quick, quick story. I was coming back with my wife on a very busy road on Friday. And the traffic was horrible. Somebody hit my car from behind. Once that happened, I reminded myself that I've been taught in this church of the seven pieces of armor that we should put on, recorded for us in Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Putting on the garment of compassion. Putting on the garment of kindness. Putting on the garment of humility. Putting on the garment of gentleness. Of patience. Of forgiveness. That we're talking about. Of love. And the other two are generosity. And the other G is? Gratitude. Gratitude. So there are nine of them. Why did I choose the number nine? Because the number nine in scripture represents completion. Why did I choose number nine? Because the number nine tells me I've done it. So what did we advise in this church? That every one of us should put on those garments. Meaning, you don't just verbalize it. Because you've said it with your mouth, when the occasion comes, it will come to your mind. Amen? Amen? And my wife reminded me by saying, listen, listen. Remember what we're supposed to do? You put on those garments this morning. I said, yes. I said, okay. Now, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to do. As you step out of the car, remember those garments. I went out. I looked at the car. It was hit. But it wasn't bad hit. But I made up my mind that Whatever it takes, I would show that person that although they did wrong to me, God will give me the means of fixing my car. Guess who came out? A young white lady. She came out. When she came, she was shaking, really shaking. And I said, please. He looked at my car. I said, there isn't any damage here. I said, it's not a damage. I had made up my mind that no matter how much you hit me, no matter how much my car is damaged, you are forgiven. She could not believe it. She kept insisting, oh, but it's not, I said, I said, listen, I am a pastor. I took my card and I gave it to her. She said, I'm a pastor's kid as well. I said, go. Don't worry. Everything is okay. Amen. I'm not saying that to tell you how much of a spiritual giant I am. It is God's grace. If I had not hidden the word in my heart, I would not have acted that way. You cannot act things out without putting this word in your heart. When you put it in your heart, when occasions come in, then you act accordingly. That's why we put on these things. We don't just put these things for a show. We don't put them on just to recite things. We put them on to live the life that God has called us to live. You see the clothes that all of you are putting on? When somebody sees you without knowing your name, you said, oh, this person was dressed like this or like that. So when we put on those holy garments, they are there to remind us. And you say a quick thing to God. Lord, I put these things on today. Now help me act out. Help me live out that life that I've been professing. Because we have too many professing Christians who don't live the life. Will you say amen with me? So looking at the text verse, forgiveness is a command. Did we see the command here? In two said, must, must. Number two, forgiveness must be experienced. If I don't know that I have been forgiven, that all of my past has been forgiven. 
past, present, and future. Everything you'll ever do. As a Christian, listen to this. As a Christian, when God forgives you, he doesn't only forgive your past on the cross. He doesn't only forgive your present. He forgives everything that you do in the future. That's a revelation for many. In Africa, we are taught your past forgiving. That's wrong. It's not only past. Your present sins that you're committing now, they've already been forgiven. Your future sins will be forgiven. There's a clear difference between being a child of God and sinning and not being in the family of God. When, when you're not in the family of God, you need Jesus. When you're in the family of God, listen to me now. You need to, when you do something wrong, quickly. How do you do it? Quickly go to God and say, forgive me. So that you restore the, the fellowship, not relationship. People who are sinners need to have a relationship with God. But we Christians, when we do things that are wrong, we need to re-establish our fellowship with God. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Praise the name of Jesus. Many pastors from my background, I'm saying this for their interest because some false doctrines have been taught. I must set the record straight using the word of God. Amen? We see from that text also that forgiveness makes allowance for God. Did you see that? It makes allowance. Let me read the scripture again. You must make allowance for each other's faults. It's not your allowance. You are saying, I've been hurt. Now, hey. Now, hey. All say now. now. Hey. hey. I must make room for God. We can have many more principles from this text. But I just wanted us to dwell on these three. Praise the name of Jesus. You know the story very well. That's documented for us in 1 Samuel 24. Where King Saul was consumed with anger and bitterness. Which we'll get to later on. About the prison that we put ourselves in. And this almost killed him that he took. Can you believe this? 3,000 soldiers to go and fight David. 3,000. It's recorded in 1 Samuel 24. To kill David. Why? David had killed Goliath. Amen. But Saul, as king, had also killed others. But their greatest victory came when Goliath was killed. And the women, you know all women, amen? Oh, with their beautiful voices. They said, King, we, we honor you. You've killed a thousand. <laughs> but David has killed tens of thousands. And Saul could not stand it. How can a man in my kingdom be praised more than that brought jealousy, that brought resentment, that brought anger. And he said, I must finish this fellow who is being praised. Listen to, to another thing that we may add here in passing. When we worship God together, the devil cannot be in our midst. Because he cannot withstand the praise of his enemy. Right. Imagine if you have somebody who is your enemy and somebody is praising your enemy in your presence. Would you be happy? No. no, go away. So, what did David do in that chase as the story goes? David saw that this Saul was coming with 3,000 warriors to come and finish him. But when Saul was in the cave resting. David went and did what? He cut a little bit of his clothing. And in the morning he said, Saul, Saul, if I wanted to kill you, I would have looked at your piece of clothing. Your 3,000 soldiers could not guard you. But I fear the Lord. You are the anointed of the Lord. And the Bible says, touch not my anointed. Don't do that. So, my beloved brethren, let's make room for God. Okay, let's go to the next slide, which talks about what happens when you use your will, because each of us has a free will, when we choose not to forgive. So, forgiveness is a choice. Listen to me, brethren. 
as we grow in the Lord, you will understand that people don't make you mad. Who has said, this person has made me mad. It, I'm doing this because this person has done this to me. Let's learn something new today. It's not what is done to you and to me that counts. It's how I react to what has been done to me. Did we get that? Did we get that? Yes. Forgiveness is a choice because you've been given the gift to forgive. That gift is meant for people who will hurt you in this life. So, you might choose unforgiveness, which is a spirit. And that spirit does horrible things inside of us. Can we now look at the three things that I, there are many that the covering of God's love, if you choose not to forgive. Number two, your prayers will not be answered. Brethren, this is the key that God has given us to communicate with him, right? right. If that is cut off, then where are you left? You are in the rain. The umbrella is there, out of your sight. And the last one is, you become a prisoner of yourself because of the wicked, unforgiving spirit that you've allowed to come to you. You allowed it. Nobody told you not to. You chose. You decided that I will do this. I will revenge. I will get even. That is our nature. But you have a new nature in Christ. Now today we know, the whole world knows that we have a gift. The gift of forgiveness. Praise the name of Jesus. You see, there's an expression that says, hurt people, hurt people. Have you worked in a firm or in a, in a school or somewhere where your boss comes to work angry? I've had that experience, right? When I was working in the Ministry of Education in Yaoundé many, many years ago, we had a boss who was a divorcee, and this lady, some morning she'll come to work. You, you say, what have I done? Because she will speak to you so rudely. She will act on becoming of a lady that we all respected. You know, why are you doing this? It is not your problem. He, she has what? A problem. Because she is bound, or she was bound, she passed that over to me. In some homes when a father and a mother disagree, sometimes the children get the hard stick, Right? A child said, but why is mommy this angry at me? Why is daddy doing this to me? Why? Very simple. It's not the child's fault. The daddy is imposing, transmitting, transferring his aggression to people who didn't do anything. So when somebody is aggressive to you, the first thing you say to yourself is, Especially if you didn't do anything wrong. No, that person has what? That person has what? A problem. Somebody once said that you cannot drink poison and expect some other person to, to die. That's what happens. An unforgiving spirit will cause you headaches, high blood pressure, unhealthy relationships and it spills over to others who have nothing to do with your anger. Now we come to the best part. Hallelujah. Amen. And that best part is how do I overcome unforgiveness? How do I overcome the wicked spirit of giving back of revenging. I have a little acrostic so that we all remember. And I plead, write this down. Amen? In fact, when I uh, read this message to my son, he said, but 
that how people remember this message. Put an acrostic there and worked on it very quickly. So, it is healed. Remember we said the message was love forgives and heals. Remember that? So, get to the healing part. Do you follow the message? So, this is the time of applying this message in our life. And the word H-E-A-L Every time somebody does something to you, the first thing is to remember H-E-A-L. Say it with me. H-E-A-L. Say it again. H-E-A-L. Heal. What does H stand for? The first thing that happens to anybody. You see, many times we Christians say we're forgiving people when we've actually put them on probation. Did you hear that? I've said that many times in this church and for the older folks, no. Many Christians put people who have heard them on probation saying, you've done this. Do it, a. Eh? You do this. You're always angry. You're always doing this. Oh, sometimes they don't even ask for forgiveness. But if they ask for forgiveness and they do it again, they say, oh, but you did this already. That is probation. You and I who have been hurt need to be healed. That's the first thing. So I go to the Holy Spirit of the living God. And I say, look, I am hurt in this way. I'm done what? I'm hurt. I'm hurting. You hurt me. Please, I plead, God, help us to understand this message. It's key to living the Christian life. I am hurt, Lord. You don't go to the person to tell you are hurt. You go to God first. You go to the Holy Spirit. Where is the Holy Spirit? In me. I'm a child of God. That's why it is absolute nonsense to think that an unbeliever can forgive. They don't have the ability to. They don't have the capacity to. They don't know forgiveness. They don't have the Holy Spirit in them who will help them to forgive. They don't know this. Why would you say, I'm going to tell you, I'll forgive you. They're lying. They're just covering up things. You can only forgive, only, only, when you have been forgiven, you have the revelation of forgiveness, and you know Christ lives in you. So, when you've been hurt, go to a corner. I have one of my daughters, when she was growing up, if you hurt her, she will leave your presence and go into the room. Hallelujah. Every time she's, you hurt her, she says, 